Welcome to Sports Econ 101, the show where we present valuable information about sports and from a business perspective. I'm your host, Edward Brown, and I'm along with my co-host, well-known radio sports personality, Bruce McGowan and Vern Glenn of CBS affiliate KPIX-TV in San Francisco. Today's show is going to be really fun because we have as guest Roger Craig, former pitcher for the Brooklyn Dodgers, the Los Angeles Dodgers, the... Um, St. Louis Cardinals, and he won World Series with all of them, as well as being a coach for uh, the Detroit Tigers for the 84 World Series. And he was uh, most recently the manager of the San Francisco Giants back in the 80s, especially during the Earthquake Series. Uh, so we're going to have him on. We're going to talk about the old baseball and, and just what it was like uh, for him playing with Jackie Robinson and, and some other players. It's going to be a lot of fun. Also, we're going to cover California Chrome uh, getting to wear nasal strips, a uh, new rule that they're allowing for the Belmont Stakes, and uh, how that affects things. My personal feeling is that um, a lot of people might not watch TV if uh, California Chrome would not be allowed to wear the nasal strip. So personally, I think it comes down to money, but we'll talk just a little bit about that. But we're going to spend a lot of time with uh, Roger Craig because it's going to be a lot of fun. and. Uh, the theme for the trivia questions is going to be never to have appeared in a World Series. So at each commercial break, we're going to be asking a trivia question about that. And the first three emails with the correct answer are going to win a free vacation. Uh, the vacations are not sponsored by the radio station, but by Lighthouse Resort and Marina. And that's located in California. You can check them out at lighthouseforfun.com. And this segment of Sports Econ 101 is sponsored by Pacific Private Money, providing mortgage investments that are yielding over 8% secured by real estate. It doesn't get any more conservative than that. Check them out at PacificPrivateMoney.com. I have some of my IRA with them, and I've been very happy with the distributions that they pay. Uh, you're listening to Sports Econ 101. You can also email me, Edward, at sportsecon101.com, a question, and we'll answer it on the air. Don't touch that dial. Sports Econ 101 will be right back with Roger Craig. Uh, here we go. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Vern Glenn. Hum, baby. There you go. There's a reason he's saying that. And Bruce McGowan. Can I do my Roger Craig? Hum, baby. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, <laughs> who won the Cactus League last year? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the reason that uh, we are mentioning... Don't need me. Yeah. <laughs> so we've got to do, we do a little introduction here. Okay, so now Roger Craig, former San Francisco Giants. i, I got to say that he is the good luck charm because in 1955, he goes ahead and starts his career with the Brooklyn Dodgers, and that's mm -hmm. the only year that the Brooklyn Dodgers won. Then a couple years later, they move out to L.A. He wins a World Series in 1959. Then he gets traded in 1964 for one year to St. Louis, and they win the World Series. Wow. Then okay. he wins another World Series as a coach with the Detroit Tigers. Roger, are you just like Mr. Lucky? Or, or did they win because of it? I'm, I'm a very lucky. In fact, uh, I have a, a World Series ring for as a player, a coach, manager for the Giants, and also uh, when Bob Riley went to Arizona, I was a consultant for him. He went to spring training with him and on the road a couple of times, and uh, they wanted to thank him. He gave me a World Series ring, so I got five. <laughs> in two, wow. 2001, that's right, that, that one that's uh, awesome. championship. Yeah. And, and it's funny because our, our theme today for the trivia questions has never appeared in a World Series. Mm. So that ain't Roger, that's for sure. No, uh, he's, a, he's been in, in and around it. Ernie yeah. Banks never appeared in a World Series. Yeah, that, that's true. And, and Roger, and, you play with uh, Gino Simoli? Just curious. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Local guy from Marin County. That's right, yeah. 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 We call him Dirty Dig. <laughs> now, Gino Simoli, for those that don't know, played with the Dodgers, played with the, I believe he played with the Cardinals at one time, Roger, and played with the Pirates when they won the World Series in 1960. And then, and then later on, drove for UPS in San Francisco. Big old stogie in his mouth. He'd run around, make his rounds. Then he'd go down to the Italian Athletic Club and play gin rummy for the rest of the afternoon. Wow. What a life. What a life. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you think this, uh, well, he's married twice, I think his first wife's name was Irene. Ah. Irene, good night. So, Roger, who was the, uh, you know, you played an, uh, enough years with enough players. Who, who was the best player you ever played with? Well, I've got to say Jackie Robinson. 
<laughs> what was it like when he showed up, though? Because I know that the first year, Jackie had to kind of button up his lip, and he was taking a lot of abuse. How did you guys feel about that as, as teammates watching him uh, go through what he went through? Well, I came up in 1955, and he'd already been there. Oh, that's like true. Four, yeah. Years, and, uh, but he still got a lot of that same abuse. And uh, at that time, his own teammates, uh, it really mellowed down, and they were all Pee Wee and all the guys. Uh, Love the guy because you know he's a great player and uh, not only the first African American, but he was a he was a great leader. This guy could have been the president of the United States, and uh, you know it's too bad he passed away at, uh, at age 53 of, of diabetes. But he was the greatest competitor I ever saw. It's like Branch Rickey told him. He said, you know, there's one thing you can't do before I sign a contract. You can't fight back. Jack, he said, what do you mean? He said. Whatever they call you or whatever they say to you, you got accepted for a while, and he did. It was tough for him, but, but he did. Roger, as a ball player, what is it about his game that you just sat back and just admired, the way he went about his business? Jackie, I would think he was a great, he was a good hitter, but I loved it when he got on base. I mean, he yeah. just drove the other team crazy. It's still in the World Series in 1955. A, a line drive to left center and against the Yankees in the World Series, and Eno Slaughter put over caught the ball. Jackie rounded second. He kind of hesitated there about halfway between second and third. He threw the second, but I got it. Jackie walked to third base. Wow. <laughs> so I, he could a single and round second. If they threw the, whatever base he threw to, he'd go to the other one. Wow. And, and you know, you, it, when he was on third base, he was a Pitcher, he really upset the whole the pitcher and the catcher because the, the catcher called all fastballs because he wanted to make sure that if he did still, he had yeah. a lot of chance to exactly. tag and all. But, uh, are, are there any players nowadays that kind of give, you know, obviously Jackie's in a class by himself, but is there any, any players nowadays who kind of give you a little bit of reminder of him? I just. Well, you can't say Puig because he's. You know, he's a little bit too much of a hothead. Are you talking about Dodgers or anybody in the league? Just anybody. That, that reminds you yeah. of, of how he, okay. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the kid from Harford, from Washington. Oh, he yeah, hurt. right. He played with Reckless of Bannon. Bannon, that's the way Jackie played. He played, I mean, Jackie played. He, he, the guy on the piece on first base, a ground ball hit on a double play situation. And that shortstop or second baseman would, you know, always make a bad throw to just to get out of the way of Jackie, because Jackie's coming barreling in there to kill him. But uh, I don't know, uh, but to anybody right now, I'm not, you know, I haven't been in for a while, but I watch a lot of ball games, and I don't know of anybody. I, I, I think this guy, uh, uh, the Dodgers, of Puig, they pronounce his name, the guy from Cuba, he's got all the talent like Jackie, but he couldn't play like Jackie. Jackie knew how to play the game. This guy doesn't know how to play yet. Yeah. See, another guy that reminds me a lot of Jackie Robinson you played with later, but he was a completely different kind of a ball player, obviously, because he was a pitcher, was Bob Gibson. I mean, he was yeah. nasty and timid. What, what yeah. was he like as a teammate? Well, he was a great teammate. Well, he was real fun and real witty. And uh, he, was a, he was a good hitter. He filled his position. You know, if you can remember him pitching, when he, when he wound up, he fell over to the right side. The, the left side of the mound, he was right in the pitcher. Yeah. And, and he, on the, but if the ball hit back to him, he was a, just a, had such quick reflexes. You know, he could catch everything and, and, you know, throw you out. But he, uh, he was like Jim Bunny when he threw so hard on the, his right side to come through. He ended up more, you know, on the, on the left side of the diamond. And a lot of balls would hit up the middle, a lot of pitchers, but not with him. He just, I just remember he was so intimidating. Though. He was so nasty. I mean, he would. Uh, there's a story about Jimmy Ray Hart who played with the Giants, a great third baseman for a couple of years. Jimmy Ray got nailed in the shoulder, broken shoulder by Bob Gibson, and he's getting up off the off the dirt, wiping himself, you know, clean of the dirt, and he's kind of in pain. And Bob Gibson just gives him this death stare, like you know, that's what you get for crowding the plate, rookie. <laughs> well, Drysdale was a lot like that. Drysdale. I mean, if you're a rookie on the opposition, he comes somewhere along the line, he's going to nail you. 
Well, hey, Roger, I want to talk a little bit about your career before we go to a uh, break. You know, it, it's like... Okay, well, that won't take long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you played for a number of years. So, you know, you get traded to St. Louis in 1964, and then they win the World Series. So, you know, a lot of people look at Gibson, but, uh, you know, maybe they won because of you. Well, I, I had a pretty good year. If I kind of bet with Gibson, I was a bad hitter. I bet him. I said, I bet you I can out-hit you this year. I was just trying to motivate him to... So really, because he was a good hitter, I, I, to, to bear down more and get more hits because he could do that. And I finally beat him at the end of the year because I didn't have that many bats because I was in the bullpen a lot. And, and uh, I said, Jack, uh, I said, uh, Bob, you owe me 10 bucks. What do you mean? I said, I beat you. My average was better than yours. He said, yeah, but you don't have that many appearances. I said, well, that's too bad. So he gave me $10. He said, right, man, I'm not going to give it to you. So I jerked it out of his hand and I tore it in half. I've still got that in half of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Okay. Uh, uh, Roger, if you can stay with us for a little bit, we're just going to go to a very quick uh, commercial break here. Uh, again, the theme is never appeared in a World Series. All right? Here's our first trivia question. Which pitcher has the most wins but never appeared in the World Series? Mm -hmm. Okay? The first e three emails uh, with the correct answer are going to win a free three-day, two-night stay at the Lighthouse Resort. Email edward at sportsecon101.com the answer to this question. Which pitcher has the most wins but never appeared in the World Series? All right? Mm -hmm. That's our question. Email edward at sportsecon101.com the answer to that question. Don't, don't, uh, don't, don't talk yet. No, don't, yeah, don't, don't, right. don't, the cups are okay. so bad. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> yeah, man. Okay, don't touch that dial. We're in the studio here with Roger Craig, a former pitcher and uh, manager of the San Francisco Giants. I'm Baby Wanna. When we get back, uh, Roger, I'd like to talk a little bit about the uh, Bay Bridge series with the uh, earthquake and all that. Give us your perspective, all right? So don't touch that dial. We'll be right back. I may be wrong, but I'm going to guess Jim Bunning. Oh, that's yeah. a good guess. Yeah, because he, he won 20 games a couple of times. Wait, hey, you have a guess, Roger? Ferguson Jenkins, maybe. Ferguson, Ferguson Jenkins, Jenkins. Yeah. There was, maybe yeah, that's Ferguson pretty good. There's a cup. Pretty yeah. good. So you, you, you go with Ferguson, I'll go with Bunny. Yeah. How's that sound? Hey, Roger, you play with uh, Rex Barney? I'm not that old. <laughs> 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 we trained train in spring training, and I was early, early. About six thirty, he I'd hear some pounding in the club, and he was out there throwing in the, between the barracks we stayed in. And the echo of his little fastball, mm. was got, I think it was Branch Ricky was working with him, was trying to work with him on his control. Wow! Well, uh, you know, we, we do have to ask Roger though also during the next segment about playing for the Mets because he was on the Mets in '62 right. and he lost yeah, 20 exactly. games. And, but that, you know, yeah. to lose 20 games, it means you got to be out there every day. Yeah. So give him credit for doing that. And, and the Mets won what 40 games that year, Roger? I think. Wow. I think it was. 40. I won 10 of them. Yeah, you won 10. Yeah. That's right. You won a quarter of the games. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Okay. Well, okay. Well, let's uh, let's let's uh, uh, get into that. Okay. Okay. All right. So uh, since I mentioned off the Bay Bridge thing, we'll get into that and then sure. ask about the Mets. Okay. okay. Here we go. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Vern Glenn mm -hmm. and Bruce McGowan. Nice to be here. And when we cut to the first commercial break, we ask this trivia question. Again, the theme is never appeared in a World Series. Which pitcher has the most wins but never appeared in the World Series? We also have Roger Craig, the uh, famous baseball pitcher. Yeah, it is. Yeah, in the break, I think he had a pretty good guess. Okay, so uh, Roger, who did you guess? Well, I would think uh, my first call would be Ferguson Jenkins because he won a lot of ball games. Okay, that's that's not correct. He's not correct. No, I, I picked Jim Bunning. Uh, Jim Bunning pitched with Detroit and Philly, and I know he never pitched in the World Series. No, Phil Negro. Phil Negro. Phil Negro. Oh, Three hundred eighteen wow. wins wow. from nineteen sixty four yeah. to nineteen eighty seven. Okay, go. so um, to Roger, I want to ask you. Just Pitch was forty eight years old, I think. Too. Was he yeah, yeah, he's, he's, like that? He was. Uh, yeah, he pitched for quite a long yeah. time. I think a good story is how Roger became the manager. Of the San Francisco Giants. Okay, let's get into yeah. that. Yeah, well, wait, weren't, you, weren't you with the Tigers beforehand? Is that right? Out there with uh, Sparky for five years, and we won it in 1984. Yeah. Yeah. Kirk Gibson? No. And Alan right. Alan Rosen calls you up, the general manager of the Giants, and uh, I mean, he didn't call you up, but maybe directly, or did he call you up directly? Yes, he called me up, but he was uh, in Houston, and he was leaving Houston, and he called me up. And, Best friends, uh, Bob Lewis was the manager. Mm -hmm. and me and my, 
bench coach when I did manage the Giants. And you know, yeah, that really saved the Giants. I think the Giants in 1985 lost 100 games. Yeah. There was talk that the Bob Lurie was going to move the team. I remember that press conference, Roger. Uh, Al Rosen shows up. You show up. And there was a feeling of hope that maybe this is going to turn things around, and it did. Within two years, you guys won a division title. How did you do that? Well, people ask me all the time about why. How did you uh, get your players to play so hard? We, we played real well at Camel Street Park. And I said, I just had a meeting before the season started. I said, you know, we're going to play 81 games here, and uh, uh, maybe more if we could win. I said, and so we might as well get used to it. I don't want to hear any complaining and bitching about it. I said, that's another thing is I want to turn off the heater in the visiting dugout. <laughs> <laughs> Roger, did you, uh, did, you teach, did you teach Jeffrey Leonard the uh, one flat down? That was, uh, I think that was 1987, right? Yeah, the playoffs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Bernie, you want to ask about the 62 Mets? Yeah, 1962, the Mets won, what was it, was it 40 games? 40 average? games they won, yeah. 40 games. Casey Stengel managed your yeah. team, yeah. And, and, and Roger, a, 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 a vaunted member of that particular team, and... Uh, Forty wins and uh, how many? How many of those forty wins did you get, Roger? One ten. Yeah. One ten of them. Twenty five percent. That's pretty good. That's you know, some perfect. people asked. I lost a lot of games there, but they said, "How did you like pitching there?" I said, "Well, I had twenty seven complete games in two years." Wow, that's amazing. Which, which brings up the follow up today: the 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 alarming number of Tommy John surgeries, mm -hmm. and Tommy John himself, Roger, said that he thought it wasn't so much overuse on these pitchers as an adult, but it's overuse from the years of, of, of travel baseball when these guys were kids. You buying that? I don't understand what you, what you said. Say that again. Uh, Tommy John thought that the reason for the alarming number of Tommy John elbow surgeries was because of overuse of these guys from when they were playing travel ball when they were much younger. Like, you know, being a uh, little little league. I know about that. I mean, uh, I think that uh, well, early they used to have it, and they still do it. I think a lot of the college uh, guys, the pitch, uh, coaches, they get the guys going good, and they, you know, they use them too much. That's why they, yeah. back when I was pitching, uh, after I pitched, they started going, we pitch on the fourth day, sometimes on the third day. And now they go on the fifth day, and they give up that extra day's rest because they first come up to the major leagues because of what they thought they they spent in, in mostly college and, and high school. They thought they pitched a little bit too much. Mm -hmm. You know, i got to ask you about 87, though, Roger. You got, the Giants finally win a division after 16 years of coming close or not being very close. And then you come within, you're, you're leading in, going into St. Louis, you're leading the championship series three games to two, and you guys can't score a run against the Cardinals. I mean, that had to be the most frustrating two games. I, I went back and covered those games, and I'll never forget how it, the bats just went silent at the wrong time. I mean, I still don't like Okendo after he got Jose Okendo? Went, yeah, yeah, after yeah. the Will Clark thing at second well, base. Well, he, he hit the three-run homer off Adley Hammerker. I know that's a painful memory, but that was a, I thought that was the, I thought that team was even better than 89. I know maybe you may not agree with me, Roger, but your assessment of that 87 team. I, you know, I, I feel the same way. You know, we we played real well, and then we, we got in the uh, beat the Cubs, and, and then we um, World Series. We my pitching was just outstanding. I think that one game that really hurt us was in that uh, Adley Hamaco, one of my favorites, who still is, was pitching. I think he got beat one to nothing, and there was a ball hit to Andy Molinaro left field, and he usually there's a real good outfield, and he charged the ball. And he dived for it and straight at him, and the ball just got by him for a triple, and he scored. And that was the only run they got, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, that was kind of was a real heartbreaker. But uh, come so close to going to the World Series, I think we'd have played the uh, uh, Minnesota. I think if we'd have won. Yeah, would have been yeah, would have been the Twins, and they, and they ended up winning. They ended up winning the World Series. They beat the Cardinals four well, games. Well, the uh, the earthquake series, uh, people. Uh, say that I caused the earthquake because I got married three days before and I was on my honeymoon. We were, we were shaking the earth a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, one thing about that earthquake was that um, the good thing about it was that uh, it happened at 5.35, if I'm not mistaken. We just finished batting practice and I went in my office and all of a sudden this rumble and rumble. I see that the ceiling was cracking a little bit and it was uh, dust and stuff was falling down and one of my players, Don Robinson, all of the earthquake. We all ran out in the parking lot there, which is real close to the clubhouse. Do you remember there? It's a stick. And then we were standing there on the asphalt, and the asphalt was just rolling under your feet. Wow. But it happened at 535, and at that time, it's the, it's the, it's the most 
traffic in, in most of every town, and they, they were going across the Bay Bridge, and, but a lot of them were at the ball game or sitting at home waiting for the game. That the, yeah. the bridge was not really crowded at that time when it happened, so it, it saved a lot of lives because of that. Well, even especially the Cypress structure in Oakland, which killed 35 people, that normally was packed. And you mentioned, you know, all the A's fans, all the Giants fans are at home watching the game on TV. So you probably saved uh, maybe a couple of hundred lives just by having the World Series at that time and having the earthquake at that time. Sure. Uh, what else do we want to ask, Roger? Well, I just got to ask you one question about the personalities you had on, the, on the, those teams, Roger, because they were very distinctive. And I'm not saying the guys today aren't interesting and don't have thing, interesting things to say, but, you know, you had Jeffrey Leonard and Rick Russell and uh, Candy Avis. Yeah, you know, you Will Clark. Davis. Will Clark. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, such a disparate group of, of people. I mean, uh, and and you all managed to get along pretty well. Was that just? But were there little fights going on behind the scenes? I know uh, Leonard and Clark got in a few scraps, didn't they? Oh yeah, yeah, at one time. But uh, I, I think what happened is we got they all got together. I had a meeting and, and not the call a meeting and what happened, but I went around to every player and at that time. Remember Jeffrey Lynn was wearing his hat backwards and all this and that. And, and so I went around after my speech and shook hands with everybody and I said, Jeff, but he was standing with his back to him and he said, Yeah. I said, uh, you know, I really appreciate it if you put your hat on. And Al Rosen really was strict about having everybody looked in uniform, especially bad in practice because some people could not see that. And I said, He said, Don't you know that's my trademark? And I said, No, I didn't know that. And he said, and I said, Well, I appreciate it if you do that. And he said, Oh, no, I didn't. You know, then the, both teams found out about it, and all the press was there. I was in the dugout talking to the press right when batting practice started. And Jeffrey Leonard came out, of, they used to come out of the tunnel, you know, right there, and come right out of the, dug, in the dugout. But he came out by the bullpen down there, walked into it, had his hat on backwards, and walked into the dugout, went and got three or four bats, and went up to the batting cage and waited for his turn to hit. And all the riders and both teams knew what was happening and so she walked into the batting cage he turned around and looked at me and put his hat on frontwards I think a lot of the press was disappointed they wanted to have a, <laughs> a big deal going about it and all but you know Jeff and I really got along good together and, and he, I told him I said you know you're a great leader and I said a lot of people respect you on this bar club to show that leadership all the time yeah, he, he, the one thing I remember most about him, I went up to interview him once, I introduced myself, and he goes, who are you? What do you want? <laughs> and he, he grabbed, intimidated. oh my God, he had that death stare, that, uh, and he grabbed my credential, and he goes, I'll be back in a few minutes. <laughs> and, he, and he was great, but you know, that was just Jeffrey, that was the way, he wanted to size you up. Now, Roger, with, with dealing with the players, uh, how important do you think it was, the fact that you had you know, won so many World Series and, and had the career that you did? Well, I don't think that had anything to really do with it. I just think that, uh, I, hello? Yeah, we're listening. We're here. We're here. Yeah. Well, I thought we got cut off. Yep. Uh, I, I know that they just knew that I was a very positive banker. I never did show the players up on the field or what happened, but things would happen. I never screamed at them at the dugout and all this. I, if I had to talk to a guy, I'd bring him in my office after the game or before the game, and, and I'd sell it in, in what I thought was the right way. And, and I think they respected that, and they, 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 they listened to a lot, a lot of my crazy things that I did, and, and I told them, I said, uh, you know, we got, we're not going to get a lot of old muscle. We're going to be hitting and running and squeezing and all this and that. And I said, you better learn the sign because they're going to be flashed to you, and you know, I don't want you to make any mistakes. And they learned the way that I like to play, and, and I see a lot of teams struggling now, that I, and that's what I would do. You, you can't wait for three run homers all the time. You've got to get something started, and that's what I did. I like to put the the defense uh, on alert, and, and you know, if you get people running, they're going to be out of position, and this is what we did, and, and they got what they liked, and they loved it. Okay. Hey, hey, Roger, stay with us just one more second, because I'm going to go to a quick commercial break. When we come back, Vern wants to ask you one last question. We'll let you go, okay? Okay. All right. For the second trivia question, again, the theme is never having been in a, never appeared in a World Series. Name the, any of the top four players with the highest lifetime average who never appeared in a World What's Series. What's kind of average? Uh, baseball. Uh, you know, Batting? Hitting. hitting. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. First three emails win a three-day, two-night stay at the Lighthouse Resort. Email edward at sportsecon101.com. We answered this question. 
Name any of the top four players with the highest lifetime average never to have appeared in a World Series. Don't touch that dial. Sports Econ 101. We'll be right back finishing up some thoughts with Roger Craig. Uh, highest lifetime. Well, Thank you. Say, Ernie Banks got to be one of them. Army Gilliver? Ernie Banks. Well, Harvey Kemper's batting average was not that good. He, he hit a lot. He hit for a lot of power, but I only think his average was about two, 260 or 270 maybe. Yeah. It was not that good of, of, a, of an average hitter. Who do you think, Roger? I know. I think Ernie Banks is one of them. I yeah. Average a little bit higher than that, though. Especially yeah. That poor ball. Game. Oh yeah, no question. No question. Poor Ernie. Got to be. Uh, I'm trying to think who else in the Cubs. Billy Williams maybe in the Cubs. Uh, no, he was have to pick someone from the Cubs because. Yeah. <laughs> well, they're they're, they're, they're like the 1908. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Richie Allen. I don't know. If, I don't think Richie Allen ever played in the World Series, but I don't think he had yeah, a average over 300. Got to be somebody from. Roger, don't you think it's somebody from maybe even. Uh, before you played, back maybe in the 40s or the 30s. I would think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll answer this trivia question. Vern will ask one more question, yep. and then we'll let you go, okay? Th right. Thank you so much. All right. Great, great talking great to you, Roger. Thanks Appreciate so much for sharing your time. It's great stuff. Yeah, okay, awesome. so we'll, we'll have you one more time. Yeah. On. Okay, here we go. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Again, I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Vern Glenn yep. and Bruce McGowan. Oh, baby. When, the, uh, when we asked the, uh, excuse me, we cut to the second commercial break, we asked this trivia question. Uh, name any of the top four players with the life, highest lifetime average who have never appeared in a World Series. And I'll tell you that most of these people, three out of four of them actually were before Roger Craig. Okay, I was going to say, Ernie Banks has got to be one, right? No. No? No. Okay, okay. so let's, let's start off with the uh, three who were prior to Roger Blank, all right? Harry Heilman. Okay. Uh, he batted 342 from 1914 to 1932. San Francisco native. Okay. San Francisco native. I could never get him out. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> George Sisler, uh, yeah. 1915 to 1930, his lifetime average was 340. Good old Nap LaJoy. Oh, that's going way that's back. That's going way back, 1903 to yeah. 1916, and he averaged 328. Okay, so now I, I'll, I'm going to give you a hint. His lifetime average was 328, and he played from 1967 to 1985. Wow. And how many teams did he play for? Uh, two, for sure. Uh -huh. And mo both of them, he did very well on both teams. Wow. Well, I'm drawing you, a blank. You, know, you got to know, you know this. Yeah. Uh, do you, you have any idea, Roger? Uh, okay, okay, I'll give you the two teams. Minnesota Twins and California Angels. Oh, Rod Carew. Rod, Rod, Rod Carew. Carew. Of course. The World Series. Did you ever of face course. Rod Carew? Uh, now, he would have been a young player when you were just finishing up. Did you ever face him, Roger? No, I don't think so. Yeah, yeah I was going to say. He was in different leagues. leagues. Well, but, but that's true. Roger yeah, was yeah, yeah, keep forgetting we didn't have interleague play. Is, is, is there a Hall of Famer that you own? Ernie Banks. Oh, no! Oh, Ernie's not listening. Oh, that's great. something about him. He couldn't be. Wow, that's great. What, what, Roger, when you uh, were pitching, your fastball, what, what did it clock out at? We didn't know. We didn't have the you didn't have a gun? Didn't know, really. Yeah. I would think I probably threw 93, 94. Wow. I hurt until I hurt my arm. Oh, that's that's uh, lighting them up. I was yeah. telling the guys I was going to try out for the Giants because I could throw in the high 60s. <laughs> <laughs> I figured everything would be an off speed pitch. Okay, so. Um, Vern, you want to ask me? Yeah, ask Roger. Me? Tony La Russa is going into the baseball. Hall of Fame. He was just inducted into the Bay Area Sports Hall of Fame. 69 years old. He's been, been out of the game for a while. I don't know whether his wife got tired of looking at him every day or whatever, but he just took over the baseball operations for the Arizona Diamondbacks. And uh, here's a guy that you certainly have, you know, battled over the years. Uh, what, 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 what do you make of a guy, a baseball man, seemingly a lifer like Tony La Russa? Tony and I are really good friends, you know. Guy, that if you own the ball club, you 
know that he's not afraid to make a big decision if he has to. You might bring in somebody probably like me. I might not want to do this or that, but not Tony. Tony looks like if he, if he feels it's right to fire somebody or somebody, he'll, he'll get it done. Sure. Uh, they got the right guy if they are going to do something like that. It's interesting what Vernon's bringing up here, though, too, because I read in the paper that Tony actually spoke to the players for, uh, right after taking over. He gave them a little pep talk. I'm not sure how much that had anything to do with it, but they go out and score seven runs off Clayton Kershaw in the second inning the other day, and Clayton Kershaw is supposed to be the best pitcher in the game, so maybe Tony La Russa fired him up. I don't know. Uh, you know, and I'm sure when he walked in that clubhouse, the, the coaching staff and the managers said, well, hey, he's here for a reason. We're about to get our stuff going. Yeah, hey, Roger, isn't it ironic that the manager of the Diamondbacks is Kurt Gibson, yeah. which is uh, maybe uh, maybe one of the primary nemesis of La Russa from the 1988 yeah. World oh, Series. There you go. Right. Wow. But I can see him run around the bases now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hobbling around the bases. And he was not, and let's put, let's put it this way, that Kurt Gibson is not an easy guy to deal with. Uh, Roger, I know, dealt with him on a different level, but, boy, he did not like Reporters, I can tell you that personally because I. He was, he was kind of rude to reporters. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, you know I was with him five years in Detroit and all. And I remember the first lady reporter came in there and he come went in the clubhouse and come in and talk naked and, and the whole, everybody Sparky was really upset about that too. But anyway, Jimmy was real. He was a uh, he was a tough guy to, to to get to know and all. But again, I had a good relationship. In fact, before he got to manage the job, he used to call me about once a month and he said, I can I can talk to you for a couple of minutes? I said, sure. So he he, had, he must talk to me for thirty minutes to ask me questions about managing them. Hmm. Was there anybody you know, Roger, you're such a nice guy. Was there anybody you didn't get along with? Forgive me? Uh, was there anybody you didn't get along with? He, you, you. Yeah. Oh, I, I got along with everybody. I mean you sound like you got along with everybody. <laughs> well, made it a fortune be you know the, the you know I, I Spoke to every one of my players every day. They come in the clubhouse, and I'm guard, you know, the, the wife was pregnant or something going on. I just wanted to be a, have a good. I did it. I did. I did it. But I didn't do it on purpose. I just did it because that's the way I am. That's the way I was. And Roger, I will say this from a personal standpoint because I dealt with you on a regular basis, along with the beat writers who dealt with you even more on the road. That you were always there and always available and always straightforward and no BS. And I can tell you that everybody covered you really appreciated it more than that though you were very successful and for that uh i think same school giant fans are always going to feel uh, a debt of gratitude so thank you i got another one for you roger i mean i i i know <laughs> I, I i have to know did, did did you ever go out of the dugout to the mound to go get a guy and and have him talk you out of mm -hmm. pulling him out of the game my crew go try it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when, so when you when you got out of the dugout to go get somebody, that was that that, that was it. Quick, the quick story: I was a pitching bench, bench coach with the Tigers. Jack Morris didn't want anybody to come out to me or Spark. Anyway, to make a long story short, he was winning one to nothing, and he rolled the bases with nobody out. Spark just said, "Go talk to him, say something to him." I said, "No, he don't want to see you anyway." I walked out there, and he's standing there with his arms folded, looking at me like, "What are you gonna tell me?" So I walked all the way to the mound, picked up the Rosa bag, threw it down right around his feet. Never looked him in the eye. I turned to Alan Trammell and said, and said something. Alan Trammell walked back to the bench. Wow. <laughs> and, what, and he just was talking to him. Did he, <laughs> he ever, ever come up to you after that and ask you what was going on? Or he just sort of figured? No, he, 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 he looked at me after the game was over. He thanked me. But then when I came back to the bench, he got too quick out. Uh, and Sparky said, what in the world are you doing? <laughs> That's a good one. That is a good one. Great story. That is a good one. Well, Roger uh, Craig, thank you very much for joining us on Sports Econ 101. We'll have to have you on again, okay? Hey, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great, you know, great talking to you, Roger. Boy, he is a in a that was, No, that was fun. Yeah. yeah. No, no, and the fun thing about Roger was that when we dealt with him on a regular basis, Unfortunately, he was talking about what was going on during the day, the daily stuff, but he wasn't telling all these great stories. So this is the, the 
beauty of yeah, having him be retired now. He's got all these stories to tell. Yeah, because yeah. we're always too busy. And yeah. We're, you know, we're, we're trying to have... Talking about who, who you're going to bat this week against this left-hander, or why is this guy not in the rotation, or whatever. Yeah, well, I mean, like, remember know, Dusty Baker was a, his, his hitting coach? I mean, he yeah, got, oh. yeah. I will get Dusty. We, we'll get Dusty. We'll get Dusty. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Tried, I tried Sean Dunstan, uh -huh. and uh, you know he said uh, too busy with the Giants right now. Yeah, yeah. So Sean we'll, Dunstan does an interesting job. He sits in the in the clubhouse, watches TV monitors, and then when he sees a close play, he gets on the walkie-talkie or whatever communications device he has and talks to Ron Wotus, their bench coach, and says, "Tell Bruce Bochy to challenge that call." Well, that's why I want to have him on because yeah. I wanted to get that perspective. Yeah. This is brand new. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah, there's an, there's another Chicago Cub, Sean yeah. Dunstan. Yeah, yeah. Right. Number one overall draft pick. One of the great Cubs of all time. Yeah, we'll question. have to have you uh, call him yourself. Uh, I'll give it a shot. You, you, you give it a shot. He lives in Fremont, so you know, he's close, he's close by. Yeah. Okay, so going on here, we got a couple things here. Um, let's see. Okay, you know what? The Belmont Stakes is coming up. Oh, yeah. California boy. Chrome. Now, he gets to wear his nasal strips. That's a great That's, that's great so he news. doesn't snore at night. That's okay? great news. Um, <laughs> so, six straight wins with it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And uh, it's funny because I wonder how much of this has to do with money. Because think about it. If he didn't get to wear it, uh, a lot of people, I think, would just assume he wouldn't win the Belmont Stakes. And can you imagine how many people would would not well, watch? From the what I understand, it it's the New York Racing Commission has become a little bit more uh, contemporary, I guess is the word, and they're not quite so um, antsy or uh, anal about all these little regulations. So this is kind of, I mean, a, a nasal strip is, is pretty minor. I mean, it's not steroids. No, right. Yeah. But, I mean, if it helps him breathe a little yeah. bit, you know. And that's a, that's a grueling race. I mean, every, yeah. how many times have we seen horses win the first two rounds of the, or the first yeah. two legs and then fail because it's at one and a, what is it, one and a half miles, I think? Yeah. Uh, like that. 38 horses have won the first two and only 11 have gone is on that to right? off. Wow. Interesting. So yeah, yeah get, California Chrome is trying to become the 12. Do you guys know why he's called California Chrome? No, no idea. When he was born and as it was getting up, he's got, he's got these white streaks of, 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 looks like white streaks of paint mm. in his coat mm. and in the I get, among the racing aficionados, those streaks are called chrome. Interesting. Interesting. So, uh, California bred? California and he, chrome. he's a little horse, too, isn't he? I mean, yes. Somebody yeah. speaking? A little a, horse sired by uh, by a mare and a stallion that, that never won anything. Mm. Didn't win anything. And losing <laughs> records. And they and they got him for, what, they got him for like, what, $10,000, I no, believe. No, 2000 right? 2000 and the, well, two thousand, and they invested eight thousand. Yeah, so ten thousand total. Wow. Yeah. Well, you're just That's mentioning story. about, um, you know, like the endurance and doing the Belmont Stakes. If you remember, one of our uh, thoughts for the day a couple of weeks ago was that a uh, a human can outrun a Formula One race car for the first thirty feet, mm. and then after that, <laughs> yeah, it's all over. It, 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 it's all over. What's, what's the average? Um, uh, speed of a racehorse. I wonder going around the track. Is it, a tw is it a 23 miles an hour? Is it, I is it more like, than that? I think it's, I think it's, I think it's like 30, 35. I think, yeah, I think it, I, I'm guessing it's 35 because yeah. I think the fastest human has run like 28 miles an hour. Wow. The yeah. first thing I did after California Chrome won the Freakness was pull up the old YouTube video of Secretariat mm. winning the Belmont Stakes. Mm. And that was a race, as a historic race. They went by over thirty lengths Amazing. and got and got faster as the race wore on. There, I don't think there was ever a horse like him. And now Firm, in four years later, won the Triple Crown. Though I'm wondering if, uh, I, yeah. but I don't think he Seattle won. Slew in '77 and Firm in 1978. '78. I'm sorry, it's Seattle. But, but Slew, yeah. is Secretariat the fastest on record. That I don't know. Yeah. Or were the other horse just darn slow? No. <laughs> he blew, like Vernon said, he blew the rest of the field away, yeah. which was just... And then, of course, we, we mentioned this, I think, last week's show, when he died, and he was an old horse when yeah. he died, he was like 33, they opened him up, and his heart was a, about yeah. half his... You know, one and a half times bigger than the average well, horse's heart. That was a fun movie. Yeah, he had, that, movie. he had that leg injury in the end yeah. that, 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 that was infected, and, it, and he was in great pain, and so they, you know, he, they humanely... Put him to sleep. In fact, uh, there, there's also a YouTube video of, of, of the last footage of Secretariat a few days before he died, and Whoa. he just happened to be Whoa. taken by accident. A, a producer from a television station was driving with his family on a family trip, and they said, "Hey, let's just go to Churchill Downs, thinking they could just visit it, just like you, you know, visit Graceland. You know, just show up and just you know take the tour, but with not knowing that they had to have an appointment." But he shows up and. They ask and, and they go, well, yeah, we can take it down to see him. And wow. so he grabs his camera and goes down and wow. shoots him. And, 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 and it's, it's almost as if Secretariat 
knew that the camel was rolling because well, he was just like well, galloping around. Another good movie is Sea Biscuit. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, we're going to get perfect. to our third and final commercial break. Here's the trivia question. Again, the theme is never appeared in a World Series. Name the players who played in at least 22 seasons but never appeared in a World Series. Mm. Well, and in this case, uh, all of them would be more, um, you know, in the last 40 years. Okay. So you don't have to worry about the old guys. Mm. All right, first three emails with the correct answer. Want a free three-day, two-night stay at the Lighthouse Resort. Email edward at sportsetime101.com. He answered this question. Name the players who played in at least 22 seasons but never appeared in a World Series. Excuse me. Don't, don't touch that dial. Sports Econ 101. But we'll be right back with some closing comments. I bet you Bert Blylevin was one of those guys. Oh, did he be pitch? home, Blylevin. Yeah. Be home. Is that the guy? did. He pitched with Minnesota, but I don't think he was on any of the teams. Uh, was he a pitcher? Yeah, was. was he a pitcher? Yeah, he was with uh, Minnesota in '91. But he was, he was with them. I think so, so he's not on the list. Or he's he is a, not on the list. Okay. Yeah. But you will know all the names. So. Carew. Uh, Aaron. Aaron. Well, Aaron played in '57 against the Yankees and in '58. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. They don't have to necessarily not even win it, but this never even appeared. Yeah. In it, you know? yeah. Well, that hurts some guy. You know, um, if you played in a World Series and your numbers are pretty good. You're much, like Reggie Jackson had, you know, Hall of Fame numbers in some yeah. respects, but his batting average, I think, was like 275, but he had so many great moments in the World Series, 73 and 77. Uh, yeah. On that list, are they, are they all are they all Hall, Hall, Hall of Famers? Are any of them Hall of Famers? Uh, I think two of them. Mm-hmm. But, but you'll, know, you'll know the names, for sure. I don't think Gaylord Perry ever pitched in the World Series. That's one of them. Yeah. There you go. He pitched for a number of teams. And... There's two pitchers. Why well, Levin's not one of them? Yeah. Jim Bunny was not one of them. He didn't pitch 22, 22 years? years? Who was the spitball? Yeah. Who was the spitballer? Well, no, this is the last 50 years. Oh, <laughs> so the, the Giants. Oh, yeah, Lord Perry. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, he, played, he pitched though, he was more, I think, 41. Seattle Mariners was his last team, 1982, I think, 83. Nolan Ryan. Okay, he's right. Nolan, well, he pitched for the Mets. He pitched the Mets. 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 Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Okay, mm. here we go. Welcome back. Last time to Sports Econ 101. I mean, um, it's not last time like the last show. Dude, you last scared time. me there. I thought you were not be What? <laughs> Saying goodbye forever. No, no, I didn't no. get that. I didn't get no, that memo. No, yeah. yeah, no, this is just for today. Um, <laughs> I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Bert Glenn <laughs> and Bruce McGowan. When we get to the third commercial break, we ask this trivia question again. The theme is never appeared in a World Series. Name the players who played in at least 22 seasons but never appeared in a World Series. Got one of them already. Which who would? Gaylord Perry. Gaylord Perry. Rod Carew. No. Who who else did we? He didn't play for twenty two oh, years. Okay. There we go. Um, who was the first? Negro. Negro. Right. Phil Negro. And there's three more. Bernie Banks um, didn't play long enough. Okay. Who's the guy who played till he was like eighty five years? No. I he, he, and they've talked about him coming back. Charlie Huff. No. Uh, who, the pitcher? Yeah, yeah, no, no, he's not a pitcher. But who did they just talk about in the last week about? He's coming. He's potentially coming back. I'm Julio getting, Franco. Getting, Julio Franco. Julio Franco. Oh, right. played Franco. 20, okay, so Phil Negro played 24 wow. years. Julio Franco played, played 23 years. And the last three guys played 22. So Gaylord Perry and who the other two guys? Wow. Boy. And what was the team you were just mentioning? The Seattle Mariners. Yes. Who, no. who would that be? Come on. On the Seattle Mariners? Yes. Who, oh, who Edgar Martinez. No. No. Who, who's probably the most famous? King Griffey? Yes. King Griffey Jr. Griffey. There he played for 22 years. Yeah. Never appeared. Never appeared. Wow. Isn't that amazing? And who's the last one? Um, the, the, I usually think of the Chicago White Sox when I think of him. I think he was a shortstop. <laughs> Luis Saparicio? No. No, no, he played, they played the World Series yeah. in 59. Harold Banks? Oh yeah. Was, oh, yeah. Was he a shortstop? No, he was an outfielder. Was an outfielder. Ah, yeah. I just I just saw him because he's a he's a coach on the uh, Ch- Chicago White Sox oh. staff. Oh, you there went you to know. the uh, the A series. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, guys, here's our thoughts for the day. The oldest continuous trophy in sports is the America's, America's, America's Cup. America's Cup started in 1851 with the U.S. winning the first hundred and thirty. Years. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Wow. And golf was banned in England in 1457 because it was considered a distraction from the serious pursuit of archery. 
<laughs> well, archery was pretty big. Yeah, absolutely, because they didn't have the guns back then. What's that ball they're hitting with those yeah. Yeah. Uh, Tune but, in next week for Sports Econ 101. We're going to be discussing sports topics from a business perspective. We're giving away more vacations for answering sports trivia questions. Thanks for listening. I'm Matt Martin. I'm your host, Edward Brown. We'll see you next week. Good night, America. So long. All right. Good. Good job. Feels good. That was good. I think about Roger. He